The U.S. midterm elections are coming right up the corner. Today, we will examine the results. How will the results of the election affect U.S.-Taiwan ties and Indo-Pacific region? Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks, covering the latest global news and analysis from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Betty Chen. I'm Rath Wang. Joining us in the studio to discuss this today are Vincent Chow, former director of the political division of TechRow, Taiwan's representative office in the United States, and William Stanton, former AIT director, the de facto U.S. ambassador to Taiwan and professor of international relations at National Zhengzhou University. In Washington, D.C., I spoke earlier to Bob Sutter, professor of practice of international affairs at George Washington University and the author of 22 books, including Chinese Foreign Relations, Power and Policy of an Emerging Global Force, as well as Jian Mingzi, president of the Formosan Association for Public Affairs, FAPA, Taiwan's largest political advocacy in the United States. And on Capitol Hill, I also spoke to Marco Rubio, Republican senator from the state of Florida and a longtime supporter of Taiwan. And I heard also from Bob Menendez, Democratic senator from the state of New Jersey and co-sponsor of the proposed Taiwan Policy Act. So, Ambassador, as with the midterm elections in Taiwan, we're having a local election, and the U.S. is also facing the midterm elections. And usually, these kind of elections are seen as a referendum of the government, especially for the ruling party. Usually, they bring disadvantages. However, we do see a surge in the support for the Democrat, in especially among the women voters, due to the Supreme Court ruling on abortion. So, my question is, how will that help the Democrat, and will the Democrat have the chance to retain both the Senate and a House majority? Well, it's hard to make predictions about what will happen in America, but, you know, judging from my two daughters, both of whom very strongly uh, opposed the recent Supreme Court decision about abortion, um, I think that there's a, particularly among women in the United States, there's very strong views among many that, um, that has to be reversed. So uh, I think the Democrats are hoping that there'll be a big turnout. Uh, women in particular will turn out, not that they all are, uh, you know, support uh, the right to an abortion. Uh, you know, many are right to life. But the hope is that that will have a big influence on the outcome of the election for the Democrats. But there are other factors uh, in the election as well. I think um, particularly with regard to Taiwan, there's never been, I think in my memory, a, a more favorable election mm -hmm. uh, from the perspective of Taiwan and Taiwan's independence, Taiwan's democracy. Uh, there's a great deal of support now on both parties, mm -hmm. as on the part of both the Democrats and the Republicans. And that's a big change. If you think back from my, my earliest memories are, you know, we had uh, the Republicans, Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon, of course, they broke relations with Taiwan, established relations with China. I mean, in later years, uh, uh, Nixon expressed some regrets about that decision. But Kissinger's been unwavering always in his support. But there have been so many others now in more recent years, Republicans as well as Democrats, who have said, you know, there were a lot of things that were wrong with U.S. policy mm -hmm. towards Taiwan. A real pleasure for me to see, having served uh, as the AIT director mm -hmm. here, uh, representing the United States in Taiwan, to see that there was so much progress has been made mm -hmm. in having uh, the U.S. take a stronger interest in Taiwan, be more supportive of Taiwan. And so I'm hopeful that although people say that foreign policy often doesn't play that important a role in elections, and the focus now is on the abortion issue, it's on inflation, it's mm -hmm. on the economy and other issues, I'm hoping uh, that for those who are interested in foreign affairs, I think the growing um, support for Taiwan and the growing dissatisfaction with uh, the People's Republic of China, I think sh might indicate a new direction uh, for uh, the elections 
uh, that are coming up. Mm -hmm. That's my hope, at least. <laughs> it's great how you mentioned China. Is that, you think, because of the support for Taiwan is from China's actions, or is it because Taiwan has much to offer? Like I think it's both. I think, I think Taiwan has achieved so much. Um, first of all, it, the way it handled COVID-19 mm -hmm. was uh, epic setting. You know, I was recently giving a talk to my students, and I pointed out that worldwide, the overall longevity, how long people lived during the COVID period, has declined in almost every country, including the United States, Russia, you name it, Western European countries. The two exceptions were New Zealand and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. They actually have longer life expectancy. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing, that it handled the, the virus so well. A second thing, I think, is that um, Taiwan has been now increasingly recognized as a a technological powerhouse, mm -hmm. and a powerhouse that you want to be on your side, mm -hmm. um, because we're all so dependent on microchips. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's great respect for Taiwan in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, finally, I think there's been a growing recognition as people are more familiar with Taiwan, that Taiwan is a democracy. It's a, f a free mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a liberal country. And I think that's appealing to many Americans. And on the other hand, I think um, really uh, China has not shown, uh, shown that it's a very attractive option for mm -hmm. many people. It's, its behavior toward the Uyghurs, its behavior towards mm -hmm. Hong Kong, its behavior towards Catholics, uh, and their treatment in China. Um, and the list goes on and on, the human rights violations, uh, there, the, the overall uh, uh, bullying mm -hmm. uh, toward other countries, in particular toward Taiwan, I think that's something that doesn't sit very well with most Americans. So I'm very hopeful that both, um, both growing disaffection from China and growing, a growing love affair with Taiwan mm -hmm. will, uh, will turn the tide uh, from a foreign policy perspective in how the election turns out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Vincent, this question goes to you, going back to um, the local elections and given your role um, as the director of the political section at Tecro and working on Capitol Hill, yeah. how do you feel the economic aspect is in terms of how voters will see? Because at, at the end of the day, as Bill Clinton said, you know, it's, it's, it, it's your pocket, it's your money, and um, how, how big do you think this will affect the U.S. elections in terms of you know, going back to what Ambassador just mentioned and, right. you know, with the, um, you know, abortion, right. China and all that? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, all elections when it comes down to it are about the economy to a certain degree. As to, to what degree, I think that, of course, varies throughout history. But certainly, I think voters in the U.S. will be looking to the economy, looking to inflation, looking to job growth, looking to... Um, salary growth as key indicators of whether to continue supporting the Democrats going forward. And I, I think the Biden administration does feel that pressure. I think that pressure is very, very prevalent right now. And you can see the actions that not only the Fed is taking in terms of raising interest rates and shoring up the U.S. currency, but also as well as in terms of how they're choosing to conduct trade relations with other countries as indicative of just how seriously they take this issue of inflation. And so I think what it comes down to is there's going to be two major factors I think consumers in the U.S. are going to look at going forward. And the first one, I think fortunately for the Biden administration, is gas prices. Mm -hmm. And of course, that has softened somewhat. But the second and most pressing issue is whether they can really start turning inflation around. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I suspect that we'll see some improvement in that respect. Mm -hmm. I think that the hikes that we're seeing the Fed do right now, I think, you know, that is obviously going to have an effect. We see the strength of the U.S. currency. That is going to have an effect on imports. Uh, so we're seeing, you know, several positive, I think, indicators come out of the U.S. And now, of course, this could have negative repercussions for the rest of the world. I mean, we've seen the British pound, the mm -hmm. Japanese yen, the euro, and all these countries depreciate massively. And there's going to be repercussions there. Mm -hmm. But I think at least for the U.S., for this current duration all the way until the midterm elections, I think we'll start seeing stronger economic indicators. And so I, I, I do think that that is going to be probably the key uh, and most important role. And, and you know, I, I say this you know, sort of jokingly, but I th also think it's true. 
that you know, all of us are in this foreign policy bubble. And, and because we've worked on foreign policy, we've worked in diplomacy in the past, we see this as a very, very important issue. But when it comes down to folks mm -hmm. you know, that are outside major cities, that are mm -hmm. struggling to make ends meet, um, that, that you know, struggling to put food on the table, I don't think this matters that much. I really don't. And so I think what it comes to, down to is that our, our people across the US, just as people in Taiwan, are going to look in their own best interests, their own best economic interests, and they're going to make a decision on whether this current administration, whether again in the US or in Taiwan, fulfills that. So I think that's probably going to be it going into the midterm elections. Yeah, in one sense that worries me a little bit because one of my great hopes has always been that there would be a free trade agreement mm -hmm. between Taiwan and the United States. Um, it was my, uh, one of my great failures, I felt that uh, we didn't make more progress on that. And one of the problems is it's not nothing to do with Taiwan, it's just that uh, there's no doubt that the U.S. has become more protectionist in recent years in its policies on trade. And this makes it more difficult, but um, I think there would be a lot to gain from a free trade agreement. And if I have one objection to the Biden administration, it's not the things that it's been saying, which for the most part have been quite good, um, but simply that it hasn't done as much as I would like to see concretely, whether in terms of defense support or trade um, or other agreements that would concretely strengthen the relationship between the United States and Taiwan. So, Ambassador, a follow-up question on the trade agreement between Taiwan and the U.S. And over the years, there have been a lot of trade talks, and also due to some agricultural issues, some of the talks have been halted. So do you think that uh, there will be a high possibility for both sides to sign a trade agreement, and how will the election results influence that? Well, you know, I think if we want a trade agreement, the best thing is not to raise it prior to the elections. <laughs> I think... Um, uh, trade agreements in general don't win a lot of support mm -hmm. uh, popularly. Um, they're just not that popular. Even though um, in many cases it's the U.S. that's gained the most from uh, free trade agreements. Mm -hmm. Why? Simply because if you're a smaller economy and you sell into a larger economy, you have less to gain. Mm -hmm. you know. Um, but a bigger economy always has more to sell to a smaller economy. So I think um, it's actually in the U.S. interest to open up trade, uh, I believe. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, not, it's not an election winner, uh, mm -hmm. as has been pointed out. So um, I just don't know. I think it's best not to discuss that now. <laughs> um, but my hope is that in the future, people will take a, a good long look at it and try to make some progress in that area and in other areas as mm -hmm. well. Um, what do you think, Vincent? You, you've been in right. you know, the policy circle mm -hmm. and tech row firsthand in terms of these negotiations. Mm -hmm. How think, probable would it be? I think we have to define trade agreement first. And, and <laughs> you know, there's a prevailing notion that trade agreements are about tariffs and market access, and that's not necessarily the case. And so if we, for example, are able to take trade agreements out of this previous notion of just you know, taxes, uh, tariffs, mm -hmm. and, and, and market access, then I think it's fully possible we'll see um, probably a concrete move towards signing something mm -hmm. uh, within the next year or so. I think mm -hmm. the 21st Century Initiative on Trade, mm -hmm. that's an excellent step forward. I think mm -hmm. it resolves, I think, a longstanding issue we have with the U.S. Not the fact that we don't have a trade agreement, but that both sides don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the reason that both sides don't talk is, as you said, Betty, we have mm -hmm. had agricultural issues in the past that have mm -hmm. prevented that. And so I think we're thankful that as a town society in general, Taiwan, we've decided to move past those mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And moving past those issues, I think, has allowed us space for both sides, for USTR and for our OTN mm -hmm. Office of Trade mm -hmm. Negotiation, to be able to sit down and lay down cards and say, this is what we do, what, what we're not able to do. And mm -hmm. for USTR, it's not going to be possible to talk about terrorists because simply they don't have the TPA passed in Congress, the mm -hmm. Trade Promotion mm -hmm. Authority. And so... And as you know, the ambassador said, as Bill said, this probably won't be passed until after the midterms, if it will be passed at all. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have to take that out of the table because we understand the difficulties of that. But as soon as we do, then we can see the potential where we can see other areas where we can make progress, digital services, mm -hmm. trade harmonization. Mm -hmm. We can it make progress, for example, on ensuring that both sides see eye to eye on how to resolve future Mm -hmm. trade issues. Mm -hmm. And all of these, these issues are just as important as serve. So I'm hopeful and optimistic we'll mm -hmm. see progress in this respect.
Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the TPA. If the TPA does not pass and say this part, the trade part, does it get thrown into some kind of other part of legislation? Do you feel that there would be less of a possibility of a, T of a trade agreement in the next year? Well, so we have to look at it like this. So the U.S. already has v quite low tariffs on, on mm -hmm. countries like Taiwan. I think the average is probably at less than 3% uh, mm -hmm. tariffs. And so the, the, I think the, the incentives you'll have for reducing tariffs aren't that great to begin with. You know, so it's, it's an issue. I'm not going to deny tariffs are an issue. But I think there are also much greater issues at play. And so for our national interest, Taiwan's national interest, what we hope to accomplish from this trade agreement is to ensure that in the future, our companies, our private enterprise in Taiwan, which our government cannot dictate who they trade with, can see the U.S. as a much more attractive destination mm -hmm. to trade with, to invest in, and so mm -hmm. forth. And so that is our overarching interest in this. And I think to achieve that purpose, there are many other methods we can think about mm -hmm. other than just tariffs. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the impact on the midterm elections, I spoke earlier to Bob Sutter, a longtime expert on East Asian foreign policy at the George Washington University, on what it could mean for Taiwan. Let's have a look. Professor, the U.S. midterm elections are coming up. Mm -hmm. And um, what impact do you think the result would have on Taiwan? Either way. I think the key thing, I guess, is who controls the different parts of Congress. And, um, and so if it looks like the Republicans will control the Congress, then I think there'll be uh, uh, pushes on the part of the Republicans to do things that will complicate things for Mr. Biden in its last, in its latter two years, looking toward the elections of uh, 2024. The idea that you don't want Biden to be successful in those years if you, if you can stop them so we can have a Republican president, that, that kind of political agenda. Uh, so that's what I would expect. Now, where would China policy and Taiwan policy fit in that? The only just random thought that I have on this is that the Republicans have been generally harder line on China than the Democrats. Uh, but I don't. But as I said, the, the this continuity, this consensus in the United in the policymaking area in Congress, bipartisan. It's bi very bipartisan. And so I don't think it'll be a big difference. It'll be a little more provocative, perhaps a little more forward-leaning in, uh, in uh, countering China, pushing uh, more counters to China than the administration might want to uh, undertake. They might, there might be more of that, uh, but I don't think very much. Uh, uh, this is serious business. The members of Congress who feel this way, the ones I know, they're very serious about this. This is not a partisan issue. It's an issue of danger, it's an issue of threat. And they're trying to protect America in this situation. And so um, I think it's very important to keep in mind. It's not, this isn't, this isn't the, uh, you know, a, a, a free ride. They don't see this as a free ride. This is very tough, very hard to do. And uh, and they and that's what they're detect that's what they're doing. They're trying very hard to defend America uh, in the Congress, and so that's sometimes not appreciated. Um, it seems a little simplistic, uh, but if you see the danger, you have a sense of urgency. What do you do? And they're, that's what they're doing. They and and Taiwan is a big part of this. There's our, they're our partner in dealing with these economic threats that come from China and dealing with the security dangers that come from China. And so, um, so I think that's going to continue because the danger it persists. Mr. Xi Jinping is going to be uh, the leader of China for a long time, and he's a very determined guy. He he does he sticks to what he believes in, and uh, COVID zero COVID policy is just one example of how he'll he'll stick to it, even though it doesn't seem to be the right thing to do. And so, um, so it's uh, that's what we're up against, and I think it's. Uh, it's, uh, so I don't think the midterm elections are going to change much <laughs> in that context. Even with the Democrat win, if it could happen. Oh, the Democrats win. Well, it makes Mr. Biden. It's easier for him to do what he what he wants. They'll be supportive. Uh, but he is convinced of, of what we need to do is to counter these dangers coming from China. Uh, I think he's he's very clear about that. He, he says, you know, he said we can't let them win. He said that several times. And so I think he believes it. And uh, it's a big transformation for him. He, two years ago, he wasn't saying that, but he does now all the time.
You just heard Bob Sutter speak about the potential disruption on the Biden administration's policy execution in the case of a Republican win in Congress. However, support for Taiwan has increasingly been bipartisan. Let's hear what Dian Mingzu, the president of the Formosan Association of Public Affairs, Taiwan's largest advocacy in the U.S., has to say in the event of a potential Republican win. And also from Marco Rubio, Florida Republican senator, on what Taiwan's support means to the world. Let's take a look. President, I wanted to ask a bit on the U.S. midterm elections um, that's coming up pretty soon. Right. How would you see the results or either um, post-election would affect Taiwan? I think uh, as a midterm election, uh, it, it usually would favor the other side, the administration party. So uh, given the situation right now with uh, inflation, everything is not uh, in favor of the administration, which is the Democrat party. Right? So for the, the past two years, there are more than 2,000 uh, Taiwan related bills. Uh, most of them actually um, is still by the Republic. Okay. And so because of the uh, Democrat, they control both houses. So it, it's very difficult to pass. And uh, if this uh, November, um, if the Republic that uh, uh, can control of the both houses, then most likely they will reach we reinstitute those bills and they have ability to pass. So we, uh, if that happened, actually it's good for Taiwan. But one thing that we always want to point out is the Hua doesn't, it's not, by, it's not partisan. We do not favor any party. So we, uh, we need the uh, friends, supporters on both sides. So we always need to have a bipartisan support. I'm here on the ground at the U.S. Capitol to speak with Senator Marco Rubio a longtime staunch ally of Taiwan. For years, America and Taiwan have worked together to maintain stability and freedom in the Indo-Pacific. Our shared respect for personal liberty and fundamental rights form the basis of our historical and steadfast friendship. Today, the Chinese Communist Party seeks to expand its international influence at the expense of free peoples around the world, especially Taiwan, whom they seek to dominate if by force if necessary. So let me be clear, if that happens, it will have economic, political and strategic consequences for generations of Americans. That makes the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, frankly, more important than ever. Countering Beijing's aggression towards Taiwan must remain one of our top priorities in foreign policy here in Washington. You just heard from Jian Mingzi, the FAPA president, and Senator Marco Rubio on the strong support across the aisle in Capitol Hill. So, Ambassador, you have been working inside the walls of the State Department for so many years. How does a Republican majority in Congress mean in terms of the continued support for Taiwan, and will it enhance or obstruct the executive branch's support? Well, I think, you know, whoever wins the election or whoever wins which House uh, looks like Republicans will win, people say, uh, in the House, and then the Democrats will hold on to the Senate. Uh, whoever wins, I think there's generally going to still be, as Mark, uh, Marco Rubio said, I think there's going to be continuing bipartisan mm -hmm. support for the relationship with Taiwan. I think it's become sort of, um, I'm happy to see it's become sort of a, a pillar of popularity or popular support. It's, if, you're not, if you're not supporting Taiwan, then what do you really represent? Mm -hmm. So I am pretty optimistic that um, the relationship with Taiwan and support for Taiwan will stay on an even keel mm -hmm. in the months going forward, the years going forward. So I'm, I'm relatively optimistic, and I'm not by nature an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> having served for six years altogether in Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to mention Bob Sutter, he talked about how if uh, the, the, the support is bipartisan, but mm -hmm. if the Republicans win, he, there could be some obstruction in terms of carrying out the actual policy. Do you see that happening? I don't think so, because um, the most vocal voices on the Republican side have been uh, most vocal about Taiwan and supporting Taiwan. And, um, but could there be a case where, say, the Re Republicans want more of a stronger stance and they oh. wouldn't want to push it, and then the, and then the Biden administration pushes back? 
It's hard to imagine. I mean, Biden actually has, of all the presidents that, that I've known and worked with or under or alongside or subsequent to theirs, they've all been um, more supportive of Taiwan. Um, Biden is arguably the most supportive ever on Taiwan issues. I mean, I remember Bill Clinton came to uh, Beijing on a visit, I think it was in 95, and uh, even before he arrived, he decided to give uh, China a gift by announcing that in the future you would have to be, uh, you would have to be a sovereign, recognized as a sovereign state, um, or you could not be a member of an international organization. That was just a freebie for which we got nothing. And uh, it came out of the blue. Nobody expected it. Um, or you look at, um, you know, we've also seen Trump, who is a Republican, who paid no attention to Taiwan whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, very disappointingly so. Uh, and actually, you know, was more inclined to, uh, you know, favor the, uh, the tough guy, uh, whether it was Xi Jinping or it was uh, Erdogan in Turkey or wherever. So I don't, I don't think, I think those categories tend to break down a bit. And I think, um, I'm, I'm very optimistic, maybe foolishly so, but I'm, I'm very optimistic about the U.S. relationship with Taiwan. And I don't, I don't see that the relationship, it's hard to see how the relationship between China, the PRC, and the United States can evolve in a more positive direction. Uh, there are too many barriers now, I think. And America's changed, and China has changed. Mm -hmm. So, and Taiwan has changed too in a positive way. It's gotten better. <laughs> so, you know, it's like it's not really a contest anymore. So, Ambassador, a follow up question. You just talked about Biden. President Biden has clearly shown his support for Taiwan especially our national security in case of a PLA invasion. So people are talking about changes, right? So the policy change from um, strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity. Mm -hmm. So what are the definition or what are the conditions for strategic clarity? And how do you make of this? Well, I think actually, I, I, you know, I, I did a column on this. Maybe it wasn't sufficiently clear. <laughs> but I argued basically that if you put all the statements that Biden has made, some of which have been contradicted by his staff or have been massaged by his staff, um, you know, you would think, oh, well, um, you know, he's, he, he actually is very clear about that he would take a stronger position in defense of Taiwan. So that makes me hopeful. I think he should go a further step. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Frankly, when Pelosi came, okay, Pelosi came and then Markey came and then another congressman came. These are symbolic gestures. They're not without their importance, although they're debatable. Um, they're practical consequences. But I would rather see a concrete statement of this is what the U.S. policy is on Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I want to be really clear about it. And there's enough statements actually uh, in the Shanghai communique about, you know, necessary for implementation of this agreement is the uh, condition that the, uh, the rights of the Taiwanese people are respected. Um, other language that basically reaffirmed our support for the Taiwanese ability to make their own decisions about their own future. So I would like to see a more forthright statement coming out of the White House. If there's a second Biden administration, it'd be a great opportunity to do that. Now there will be people, including people like Henry Kissinger, would say that'd be a disaster. You know, uh, we need to cling to uh, strategic ambiguity. But it's not like um, the PRC does us any favors. They always say exactly what's on their mind. They've made it very clear that they want to dominate the world, for example. <laughs> so I, um, I think we should be more clear than we've mm -hmm. been. Well, thankfully, folks like Kissinger have been proven wrong and wrong <laughs> again and again. Absolutely. History, you're so. absolutely right. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. Can't argue so with going you. Going back yeah. to you, I just wanted to ask a bit about the actual work done on, you know, in D.C. when you were there and how do you ensure that 
support is bipartisan and that Taiwan support is unwavering no matter who is in the White House? Well, it's easy. I mean, I think there's a principle at play, which is respect for democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think we have the same amount of respect for U.S. democracy as the U.S. has for Taiwan's democracy. And in that respect, you know, we don't take sides in elections. We don't, um, we don't pick and choose who we think will win. I think we make friends with everybody and we assume that the and we know that the U.S. populace is mature enough to make their own decisions and who they want to lead them in power. And so I think from Taiwan's perspective, it has always been a case where we've striven to make friends on a bipartisan basis. Uh, we've tried to identify uh, and to make friends with people that we believe, regardless of political power, uh, regardless of political party, may one day be in positions of influence in terms of the Indo-Pacific or the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, we've tried to make ourselves, I think, in alignment with how um, the U.S. sees and believes that its interests should be protected in this part of the world. And I think we've been successful in that respect. I think um, if we look at sort of, um, and honestly, I think sort of the anxieties that were at play, not only when Trump was elected in, uh, in, in 2016 and 2017, and took power in 2017, but also Biden and the transfer in power, there are some anxieties, I think, within Taiwanese society. Just because I think the support from the U.S. is so vital to Taiwan mm -hmm. that nobody can really, you know, take the risk of this being um, somewhat uh, watered down mm -hmm. uh, because of a new administration. But, you know, for us in Tecro or for folks, I think, within the town government, there was no anxiety whatsoever. And I think that was because we spent so much time and effort building friends on both sides of the equation and making sure that both Republicans and the Democrats understand our interests, our values, and what we enjoy in terms of commonality with the U.S. Can you talk a bit about the specific processes of building friends? Do you have a process where you identify which individuals to go to and then strengthen that? Well, I think the, the process of building friends, and, and you know, to be honest, Bill has been in this a lot longer than I have, but you know, from my short experience in D.C. Well done and well said. <laughs> <laughs> From my short experience in D.C., I think it's really identifying common values and common interests, the mm -hmm. same as building any other friendship. Mm -hmm. And so I can give several examples of this. For example, when COVID first broke out, we had a supply of face masks here in mm -hmm. Taiwan. Um, you know, in the U.S., I think across the U.S., not only, I think, within society in general, but also hospitals, within governments, there was an acute shortage of uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. And so, for example, when Taiwan goes in, we don't condition donations mm -hmm. based on, say, we want support from you on this. No, we do it because we want the U.S. to succeed just like the U.S. wants us to succeed. And so I think that's how you build friends. So when we, for example, donated uh, tens of millions of uh, PPE across mm -hmm. the U.S. to hospitals, to local community centers, to veterans organizations, and to uh, the government, even at one point the White House had made in Taiwan masks on, mm -hmm. you know, we did this as a symbol of friendship. And so when Taiwan had an acute shortage of vaccines at one point, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when our deliveries were um, not going according to our hopes at one point, um, we had, you know, we saw the U.S. jump in and make its largest vaccine donation anywhere mm -hmm. in the world at that point to a country that was doing relatively well mm -hmm. on COVID. Mm -hmm. And they did that without political preconditions. They did that because they truly wanted Taiwan to succeed. So I think we approached this relationship kind of on that basis on the basis that we truly believe that what's best for the U.S. is best for Taiwan and vice versa. And so we're going to do everything we can to support U.S. interests and U.S. values and hopefully the U.S. continues to do the same for Taiwan. So speaking of friendship, um, recently we have received several very influential U.S. delegations to Taiwan, especially in August when House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. After that, we do see rising tensions across the Taiwan Strait. We have the, um, say, exercises or you can say provocations from China against Taiwan. But we do see the change in the narrative saying that now it is China changing the status quo, not Taiwan. And how does public from the U.S. perceive this kind of change in the narratives and how will that affect the uh, midterm elections? Vincent. Well, I, I think it's like this. I think if you go through uh, news in the U.S. right now, whether it's from New York Times, from Fox, from any news outlet, it's all about the dangers mm -hmm. we face across the Taiwan Strait. And, and you know, on, 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 on one level, I think that is, it's not a bad thing. I think it's not a bad thing for this to be more prevalent in terms of the challenges and dangers Taiwan faces from the CCP. But from another perspective, it is um, a bit you know, it's a bit disappointing because Taiwan is a multifaceted society. We have so much to offer the world and the focus shouldn't just be on the security aspect. But, you know, back to that point. So I think 
from what we see within the U.S. right now, there is widespread understanding of the challenges Taiwan faces from the PRC. Mm -hmm. I think there's widespread understanding that the PRC is the provocateur in this case. Mm -hmm. And that it is, I mean, there are any hundreds mm -hmm. of PLA A A AF uh, jets across the Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, center line of the Taiwan Strait, not us. I mean, we're not sending, f mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> our raw calf planes over the, Taiwan, uh, over the Taiwan Strait on their side. So I, I, think, I think that has generally been seen across the US. And so I think what we see in, in terms of the midterm election, and I say this with the full understanding that I think this is ultimately beneficial for Taiwan, but I think it has entered mainstream consciousness in the mm -hmm. US. I think there is, I think, mainstream debate on the US on best ways to support Taiwan. And even for people, I think, across the political spectrum, they may have different views in terms of how much of a posture they believe the US should play in the region on whether they believe that the US should ultimately send troops to the region, for example. But I think within that, there is that consensus overwhelmingly mm -hmm. that arming Taiwan, that making sure Taiwan has the capacity to defend itself, that is the best course of action we can take right now. Mm -hmm. And so I fully expect that this sort of consensus will continue on in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only thing I would add to that is I think the US should do more to help defend Taiwan. I think it's, as I said, delegations are all well and good, but I'd like to see uh, more military delegations as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. showing support. I'd like to see more arms sales. I'd like to see the Taiwan Policy Act passed. Um, I'd like to see concrete, substantive support that strengthens uh, Taiwan's defense. Uh, I think that's very important, particularly if you're going to do things that, um, that the dragon views as, uh, as uh, sticking a, uh, putting a stick in its side through the, through the cage. <laughs> which, is, which is almost everything these days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a very easily angered beast. So, uh, you know, I'm, that's fine with me, but I think we, the U.S. also has a responsibility to do more that's concrete and substantive mm -hmm. to help Taiwan. There are also voices that because Taiwan seems to be more complacent in terms of with our, you know, our civil self-defense. Mm -hmm. So if there's an increase in that, there would be more U.S. support. What do you say to that? Well, I think people are probably thinking of the analogy with Ukraine, which did a splendid job simply by standing up to the Russians of winning worldwide support. Um, I was very happy, for example, to see that um, recently that Robert Sow um, <laughs> stepped forward and made a huge contribution mm -hmm. to the defense of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I think that's not only symbolically important, but it's substantively important. It's somebody who's, uh, you know, been a great success as a businessman uh, in the, uh, you know, Micron, his company. But at the same time, he's someone who says, you know, I love Taiwan and I want to stand up for Taiwan and I want to help Taiwan. And, um, you know, I'd like to see a little bit more of that from um, there. Are, you know, he's not the only wealthy person in Taiwan. <laughs> And I'd like to see others who have the ability to do so to step forward mm -hmm. in other ways and say, you know, um, I love Taiwan and I'm, I'm going to show my support for it in, in these ways. Well, and Bill, you've shown your support for Taiwan. I mean, you're here <laughs> yes. physically in That's Taiwan. Right. <laughs> well, After your time and you're, you're here. Yeah. You know, I, Taiwan accepted me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we love you. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... Um, well, Taiwan is a kind of, I always tell people this. In fact, I, the new president of, uh, of uh, Jiangda, I was talking to him yesterday, and I said, well, you know, Taiwan is actually a, a very easy country to love, which is why I'm very happy to see with the downturn now in the virus of fervor, um, more international students are now coming back to Taiwan from all over the world. Um, in my class, the very large class, there are many students from, from Europe, from uh, Latin America, from different, from Asia. Um, and I think that's important mm -hmm. because I think people who see Taiwan and meet the Taiwanese, it's hard not to fall in love with Taiwan. Mm -hmm. It's one of the friendly, I, I've been in many countries, but Taiwan is friendly. They even put up with me. So, <laughs> so I, you know, I, I think this is a, that's also a very positive step. Taiwan sells itself, but it also has to make a little bit more effort sometimes 
mm -hmm. to say, hey, take a look at us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, mm -hmm. we're worth looking at, because mm -hmm. yeah. Taiwan is. Sure. And Vincent, selling that story in D.C., what do you feel resonates most with U.S. politicians or people in power there? I think there's two parts. The first one, I think, I think this idea of David versus the Goliath, I think that really sells, I think, in the U.S. consciousness. And I think that has been the case Good. throughout American history, mm -hmm. where if you go all the way back to the Civil War and you had sort of a ragtag group of militia uh, coming up fighting against the British Empire, and sort of that has sort of triggered, I think, the U.S. consciousness over the past, you know, three centuries. And so it, this idea that Taiwan is standing up for ourselves and this, this idea that we're standing against all odds on the front lines of democracy, I think that's a helpful narrative to have. And I think it's a true narrative as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, going back to your last question about defense and, and having a robust defense plays into that. You know, we have a saying in Chinese, which is tian uh, zu zi right? Mm -hmm. Which is that, you know, that people who support themselves are supported. And so if Taiwan is, continues to be able to ex display that sort of determination to defend our freedom and democracy, I do think that that ultimately encourages people to support us even more. And so I think that's part of it. The second part of it, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm this really big fan of, of trying to build on this idea of Taiwan as a cultural identity throughout the U.S. And so I think if you look at the past history, Taiwan doesn't, hasn't really been able to build a cultural, separate cultural identity in the U.S. And so it's sort of been lumped into this general idea of Chineseness and this broader idea of Asian Americanism. And I think, I, think, I think there's something there that separates us from, I think, other cultures here in the region. And we really got to show that. And so, you know, I, I'm always very enthusiastic, for example, when I see young people in New York holding bubble tea festivals <laughs> or doing like Taiwanese art exhibitions. And I think that is important from a diplomatic perspective because, again, we have to understand that the U.S. is a democracy. And, you know, support, political support goes nowhere if you don't have public support. And so being able to build on that public support, being able to build on how the public sees Taiwan, I think that's important for Taiwan's long-term interests as well as our long-term relationship with the mm -hmm. U.S. Speaking of bipartisan support for Taiwan, friendly legislation, Senator Bob Menendez, the co-sponsor of the Taiwan Policy Act, shared with us why this legislation is so vital to both Taiwan and the U.S. Let's have a look. China is our biggest geostrategic challenge, and no one knows that better than the Taiwanese community. You know, the Taiwanese community has shown extraordinary success both in Taiwan and here in the United States. It is hardworking, industrious, entrepreneurial, um, and uh, incredibly well-educated. And all it needs to do is to be left alone to continue to do that and to enjoy its self-autonomous uh, rule. Uh, unfortunately, China has a different view in what it seeks to do to Taiwan. And under Xi Jinping, we have had the most incredibly uh, belligerent China towards Taiwan that we have ever seen before. The reality of the cross-straits situation has changed under Xi Jinping's rule in China. So that's why, as was mentioned before, you know, I drafted legislation to update the Taiwan Relations Act, which is our law that has served us well for 43 years, but we're in a different moment in this time. And we needed to update it so that we could help Taiwan be better prepared for the future, a future in which it is more capable of defending itself, mm -hmm. uh, a future in which it is more internationally integrated. And the Taiwanese have shown themselves, for example, in this pandemic, to be at the cutting edge of the things that countries needed to consider doing. Uh, so, uh, and that's what we did in the Taiwan Policy Act, uh, which got a lot of work, believe me. The end result always looks easy. It's not, it's not that easy, but we got a 15 uh, to, uh, I mean, a 17 to 5 vote uh, in the committee, bipartisan, strong vote, uh, which I hope now to include in one of the major bills that have to pass before the end of this year. 
We've just heard about the importance of updating the Taiwan Relations Act from Senator Menendez in bolstering Taiwan's economic ties, international participation, and most importantly, strengthening its self-defense. So my question for Ambassador, how likely will the midterm elections affect the passing of the long-anticipated Taiwan Policy Act? Would a Republican majority derail its passage given the language requested by the administration? What's your take on the Taiwan Policy Act? Well, I hope it passes, uh, but I really am not familiar enough with the details and what the debates are currently. Um, you know, there are, I gather some objections on both sides of the aisle um, and little changes that they want. And there's always a negotiation, whatever legislation is passed. But overall, I think there's a recognition from what I read that that this would be a positive step forward for the relationship. And therefore, one way or another, we need to make progress on this. Mm -hmm. So I remain hopeful. That's all I can do. I, I don't have any influence with Washington. Um, I do know how I'll vote. So I'll <laughs> vote the side that I think will come out on the right, right side of things. But. Um, I don't know. I would ask Winston, the thinking? ambassador here. <laughs> well, you're the only ambassador here. But, uh, Are you hopeful? Rep hopeful well? rep political representative. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic, I think, that the Town Policy Act will become law. But I, I do think we have to sort of split the Town Policy Act into its different titles. And, mm -hmm. and Title II is the one that deals with, for example, the foreign military mm -hmm. financing mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. And I think on that part, there's widespread consensus that that needs to go f and that needs to be passed fast. Mm. And so I think if you if you do look at the congressional record, you'll find that even the, the senators that voted against the Town Policy Act in general still supported this idea of Title II passing as yeah. fast as possible. So I, th I think it's a it's it's quite a real possibility it will prop that we'll see Title II uh, be rolled into NDA, the National Defense mm -hmm. Authorization mm -hmm. Act, and that will ensure its passage as a matter of course. Mm -hmm. The so-called softer issues are the ones that are that's people right. are debating, I think. That's right, and I think that's going to take a bit more time. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I think that's going to work out as well. Um, I think, again, with the sort of momentum we're seeing on, on, on Capitol Hill right now on Taiwan mm -hmm. issue, I think, and the way that some of the language has been altered to ensure that it is more, I think, softer in term, and, and, and more um, I think uh, consistent with what this what the Biden administration has been doing, I think that's going to aid its passage as well on a bipartisan ba basis. So my expectation, and please don't hold me mm -hmm. to this, but my expectation <laughs> is that we'll probably see the defense issues and the security um, and the security agreements uh, rolled into an NDAA and that being passed, um, I think, in, in, in due course. And I think in terms of some of the other issues, including sanctions, including sort of the political improvements and all of that ish and the and the sense of congress on uh, free trade agreement mm. i think all of that may take a bit more time but ultimately i'm hopeful and optimistic as well in that respect mm -hmm. yeah i'm mm -hmm. um, talking about the taiwanese american community there seems to be a lot of voices in terms of the symbolic aspect how how do you think that part will pass or do you feel that that probably will be hold out of the last part of it so i think as a matter of principle it's the symbolism it's important and, and I think there are people that say um, that symbolism is completely unimportant and that, and that you know, we should just focus on the substance and that given the, the nature and the timeline of the threat Taiwan faces, um, there shouldn't be any room for symbolism. I, I, I don't agree with that. And, and, and I have a reasoning behind it, which is, you know, we, we, we are a democracy as well. We have to allow people the ability to have optimism and, and, and to have hope in this relationship and, and, and for people to see, I think, substantively the support that is coming from the U.S., not only on the substantive issues we've talked about, defense and so forth, but also on the symbolic issues. Because in the end, I mean, those issues matter to many Taiwanese people. And, and I think by mattering to a lot of Taiwanese people, that shouldn't be discounted. Mm -hmm. And so I think, though, that there is a certain balance that has to be struck. You know, that I don't think in any situation where if we focus completely on symbolism and they substantive issues that's going to support Taiwan's defense in the long run. Like that's obviously not going to be the case. Mm -hmm. And so I think finding that balance and striking that balance, ensuring that balance is well communicated with both sides, I think that is an important part of what our work in the U.S. is about. And I think it's also an important part about the discussions that both sides have, I think, on an ongoing basis. So I think in that respect, you know, I, I do hope that we make a lot of progress 
on the substantive issues, on defense issues, and mm -hmm. so forth. But I think on symbolism, there has to be some level of leeway and room mm -hmm. allowed for symbolism mm -hmm. and to allow people in Taiwan to continue to believe in this relationship and see that you know, their aspirations are taken care of. Mm -hmm. So you do feel that there could be a possibility that Tecro will become TRO? <laughs> well, I, I, again, I'll use that term hopeful and optimistic. Okay. And, I, and I, I'm not saying that as a politician, which I, although I am at this point. But I, I'll say it like this. I think it's entirely consistent with U.S. policy. Yeah. If we look at the American Institute in Taiwan, it says Taiwan, not Taipei. If we look at the Taiwan Relations yes. Act, it says Taiwan, not ta Taipei. Mm -hmm. Xiao Bi Kim is representative of Taiwan in the U.S., not the representative of Taipei city government mm -hmm. right. in Taipei. Mm -hmm. and, so there, and, and, and so there isn't any sense within any U.S. policy, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, no, and, but I don't think I am, right. that says we have to use Taipei rather than Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then if you look at another aspect, which is the status quo, and this is entirely keeping with the status quo as well, and people ask why. I'll tell, uh, and I'll say it like this. When President Tsai took office in 2016, there were about seven or eight non-diplomatic allies we had around the world that used either Taiwan or Republic of China within their office names. This included, for example, I think Jordan, um, Dubai, um, Nigeria, and some others. And, and all of this was changed under pressure from China. Uh, and, and so Taiwan and the Republic of China were renamed as Taipei. Mm -hmm. And so to a certain extent, it, extent, if we can reverse that a bit, and if we can start to have offices being called Taiwan, I think that is entirely consistent mm -hmm. with sort of the status quo, if we can define it as that, as mm -hmm. this was, uh, our diplomatic space was um, in 2016 and 2017. And so I, I, I do think that ultimately um, this will, um, I think, be accepted, mm -hmm. um, this, this, this renaming of Tecro, and I think ultimately it will be beneficial mm -hmm. to our relationship with the U.S. Moreover, I would just add that when you listen to uh, uh, political figures around the world, when they refer to Taiwan, they refer to Taiwan. They don't say Taipei. Mm -hmm. I mean, people say Taipei. You know, they, they'd have to think a minute. It, it's everyone refers to Taiwan. President Biden, when he talks, he doesn't say, "Well, uh, <laughs> we have to look at how we're going to help Taipei." <laughs> no, he's not interested in, you know, the city of Taipei particularly. He wants to help Taiwan. So. I think I, it's, a, it's a much needed change that, that should happen. It doesn't make any sense the way it currently is. It's, it was clearly a sop uh, to the PRC at some point. They knew they could get away with demanding it, and they got it. Um, but it's not abided by in practice. Nobody refers to Taiwan as Taipei, mm -hmm. uh, unless they put it on a sign on top of a building. And, mm -hmm. It, you know, you may have to say it, American Institute in Taiwan, so. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it. yeah, yeah. Going back a bit to substance, um, Bob Menendez mentioned how important the self-defense of Taiwan is and with the NDAA and all that, and, and Vincent also just pointed that out. Is 6.5 billion U.S. dollars sufficient, or is that a good start? If, this is a question for both of you. So. I, I'm, I'm not a defense expert. Offhand, I would say um, that too much is never enough <laughs> when it comes to defense. I mean, that's the way I know our military always looked at it. And uh, I know the military advisors, U.S. military advisors that I've spoken to who have come and advised Taiwan have always believed, but of course they come from a very wealthy military establishment, uh, in the United States that more needs to be done and should be done. So I would, I would be, I'm not, again, an expert, but I would tend to think it's a good start. But down the road, you probably need to do more. But I would add to that, that I've often thought that, um, and you know, this has annoyed some of my, my friends because I've said, after all, we provide an awful lot of aid to Israel. And we need to think of Taiwan a little bit more the same way we do mm -hmm. Israel and give it the, the, as much support mm -hmm. as we do. And to be a little bit more open about mm -hmm. uh, in what we're willing to share, what we're willing to do. Um, you know, it's, it's one of our closest friends, very closest friends in the world, and I think it needs to be treated that way. And... Um, I think we should be a more active participant mm -hmm. in the defense of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if I can add to that, I'll, I'll probably point out that the $6.5 billion with an FMF, I mean, they're, they're on a payment schedule. They're, they're on a mm -hmm. schedule, which I think tears up as, you know, the further down you go. And I, I would actually prefer to see that reversed. Uh -huh. So there's actually a lot of support we need now in terms of um, the next two, three years. And I'll say the next two, three years because military equipment takes time to produce. Yeah. And so the, the purchases that you make today are going to show up in Taiwan years from now. And so when you have sort of the largest bulk of the sum in uh, years, you know, four, five, six, then obviously you're going to see sort of the equipment that are delivered as a result of this maybe a decade from now. And, but we do know that having a strong defense deterrent is probably the key, the, the key towards keeping peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait today. And so, you know, to your question whether it's enough, you know, I, I completely agree with Bill. It's, it's, it's never enough. Yeah, I think, you know, but with that being said, I think we have to be thankful. Mm -hmm. as, as, as people of Taiwan, I mean, this is coming from U.S. taxpayers. I think it's recognition of the unique bond we share, but it's also recognition, I think, of our shared interests yeah. in keeping peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. And I think, I think it's really up to us to ensure, ultimately, that uh, we're responsible for our own defense and that we have the capacity to defend ourselves. And we're grateful that the U.S. has decided to add on to it, but it shouldn't be the factor you know, determining whether you know, we have this sort of determination to defend ourselves. And so, you know, I, I do want to share a bit of, tiny bit of history on, on, on this FMF issue. And, and it is my understanding that, you know, there is a lot of equipment that Taiwan should be buying, be buying today in terms of enhancing our asymmetric framework, in mm -hmm. terms of ensuring we have su sufficient, for example, firepower to deter, you know, a landing scenario and so forth. And I think a lot of this, um, you know, our, 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 our funding that needs to be spent today and so the fact that, you know, we, we do have a relatively, I think, small defense budget, you know, that is not entirely commiserate, I think, mm -hmm. with the threat mm -hmm. we face. Mm -hmm. And so I think FMS, FMF was designed in part to shore that up and to ensure that, you know, we are able to make investments today that will deter war in the future. And so I think there's a very specific purpose for FMF. And so, you know, what it comes down to, I think, full circle, is that when we look at FMF, it should be part of our larger so FMF is not just a figure, it's really, it represents an investment, I think, in specific pieces of equipment that are needed sooner rather than later, and equipment that have a potential to ensure that when Beijing looks at the Taiwan Strait, they're going to understand that they're going to pay a heavy, heavy price.